When we think about the American Revolution, we often assume that America was united in throwing off the rule of England to form our own government. But in fact, it was a time of extreme political divide that tore apart families and friends as tensions rose. Stay tuned. Ahead, I'll talk with Joyce Lee Malcolm about the times that try men's souls, the Adams, the Quincy's, and the battle for loyalty in the American Revolution. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Joyce Lee Malcolm is an emeritus professor at George Mason University School of Law. Her previous books include Guns and Violence, Peter's War, and The Tragedy of Benedict Arnold. Joyce, welcome to Some Books Considered. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your having me on. In the book, you liken the American Revolution to a civil war. And I think a lot of us do have that sort of romantic patriot notion that this was a united nation just ready to throw off the chains of the uh, you know, rule from England and form our own government. But it wasn't really like that, as you point out in the book. No, most people think that uh, when I mention a civil war, it's the American Civil War that you're talking about. But there was a lot of... Uh, disagreement about the route to go, how much intimidation to use, what families should do, the divisions between wives and husbands and fathers and children. Uh, so the more I looked into it, the more I discovered that a lot of the real poignancy on the ground of the people living through it was that some of their best friends and relations were on the other side. Uh, didn't necessarily fight on the other side, but were intimidated and fled. There are a few things I want to talk with you specifically from the book, but we won't have time to talk about everything. So give us a quick overview of what readers will find in your book. Well, I try and set the experience of particular families and other people that they knew against the background of what was going on. And they start off, of course, with a lot of agreement on not wanting taxes by the British, not being willing to prosecute American smugglers like John Hancock. And then as the British really clamped down with their new king and, and bringing an army, uh, there's more and more division and intimidation. And I think what's surprising and maybe unexpected is that there was a lot of intimidation where uh, there were committees of observation to spy on neighbors and see whether they were adhering to the British boycott, boycott of British goods. And, and that became more and more oppressive. And with the, um, with the, the Sons of Liberty in 1765, after the Stamp Act, there were organized mobs really terrorizing people who uh, looked like they were working for the British or were willing to um, get sell the stamps. And I look particularly at the, the uh, Quincy family, who had an older son, uh, Samuel, who was a lawyer, and ends up fleeing into exile. I shouldn't say fleeing. He thought it was going to be a good idea, leaving his wife and children, who were patriots, to be taken in by his, uh, their, his brother-in-law. And the, um, uh, John Adams and his best friend, Jonathan Sewell, who had been extremely close and worked together as lawyers and wrote each other when they were apart. And Sewell has a government office and his home has been attacked by a mob. Although I should say that his wife, uh, he wasn't home and his wife offered the mob his wine cellar if they dispersed, which they took. <laughs> they thought a minute and they took it. But at any rate, he was worried and fled to, to Boston where the British there was British safety, and then eventually went to exile. And his wife, who was a Quincy, um, had a younger sister who was married to John Hancock. So there are letters back and forth. There's a tremendous amount about the experience of those people who went into exile, thinking it would be just for a short time, and not knowing what they would you know, find there. And their families back home, and the trials and tribulations of them, and their concerns for those in exile. So there were those that fled either because they had some loyalty to the crown or they were just concerned for their own physical well-being that they were being threatened. So 
And as you point out, they a lot of them thought this would just be temporary. They'd just go there for a while and come back. But then in comes the Banishment Act. Tell us about it. Yes, that was something I, until I started investigating this, I had no notion of. But uh, a couple of years into the war, um, Massachusetts and other uh, now states passed this, this act with a list of people who had fled, absentees, they called them. And although they had not taken arms against the Americans, they should have been there to help the Americans. So they banished them from coming back. If they came back without permission the first time, they would be transported to some British territory. If they came back a second time without permission, they would be executed. And then later, shortly after, um, the, they passed statutes to confiscate all the property of these people and sell it at auction. So those people fleeing, thinking they would be away for a little while, ended up banished basically forever. And and again, I imagine that there were circumstances where maybe, let's just say the husband left, but the wife was actually pro-forming a new nation and uh, was on, quote, the right side (laughs) for the times. And yet their property was, cons- you know, uh, confiscated, even though they were sympathetic to the American cause. Yeah, occasionally there was some wife who managed to secure the property, but usually it was confiscated and they were left, you know, with nothing. Um, and, and it was rather sad on the Quincy side because the senior Quincy, who was a patriot, had this older son, Samuel, who'd fled, gone into exile, leaving his wife and children who are patriots. And yet when he dies, he leaves everything to the 12-year-old son of his younger son who was a who died, but who was a son of liberty. So the sons who were raised in a patriotic household uh, got nothing. Um, there was, you know, at first, I think there was more sympathy for people who, who had gone into exile. And then, you know, the sides hardened as the war went on. So there were very few after the war who felt, who were in exile, who felt that they could come back. So in addition to profiling the Quincy family, you also talk about the Adams family. Tell us a bit about their experience during all this turmoil. Well, it was Adams' best friend, uh, Jonathan Sewell, who had gone into exile. He had pleaded with Adams not to go to the First Continental Congress and Adams has said, you know, I've crossed the Rubicon. I mean, to live or die with my nation and my new country. And um, and they were parted. And um, after, and corresponded, but after the war, when Adams at, went to Britain on a mission, he saw Sewell there. And there's a wonderful comments of both of them of what they thought of the meeting. You know, Adams took Sewell's hands and he said, you know, my old friend, and but he he thought Sewell it was looked like a man defeated living only for his children, and Sewell for his part felt that Adams was in the wrong position. He was no diplomat. He shouldn't be there. Um, but it, uh, there there are others like um, Benjamin Franklin, whose son William, who he was very close to and wrote dedicated his autobiography to, ended up being the royalist governor of New Jersey, um, and. Um, and he ends up going into house arrest and eventually into exile. Um, so there were a lot of, of families like that or whose children went on both sides. Um, and, and it's surprising how many of the founders had families who were all in exile. And yet they prosecuted any loyalists they found in the U.S. So um, it's, it's a whole aspect of it. Um, one of the things I, I quote at the beginning is Adam saying, posterity, you will never know what it costs the present generation to preserve your, your freedom. And I tried to get at what that cost was. And it wasn't just economic dis, you know, dissension and turmoil and, and people getting killed. It was also these very close family relationships. Um, and after the war, a lot of the so-called absentees who never fitted in in Britain. They, there was no place for them in the British society. They felt more and more like Americans. Um, they end up 
uh, getting land uh, from the British government in Canada. And the Atlantic provinces are basically settled by these American refugees. I'm talking with Joyce Lee Malcolm about the times that try men's souls, the Adams, the Quincy's, and the battle for loyalty in the American Revolution. And our conversation continues in just a moment. If you appreciate this discussion, please take time to subscribe, like, and click on the bell so that you'll know when I post new interviews with authors. And thank you. And you also point out that there were a lot of people who just didn't want to be involved in all this turmoil. They just wanted to get on with their daily lives. But with everything that was going on, it was hard to avoid it. It was very difficult to be neutral. Um, you know, some tried. And in fact, historians assume that only 20% of the population was actively involved. But you had to take an oath of allegiance to support the colonies and, and be against the British. Um, after the Declaration of Independence, you had to take an oath of allegiance to the, the new governments of these states. Um, so you did that or you were arrested and disarmed. Um, so th they didn't leave you much choice. And there was a lot of intimidation and, and violence. And I think once the violence begins to be used by the Sons of Liberty, they can't control it anymore. It really gets out of hand. Um, and um, and people fear for their lives. There's one awful story of an English clergy, you know, Church of England clergyman in America who was threatened to have his eyes pulled out. He rode himself out to sea, 16 miles out to sea, in order to get to a British vessel to take him into exile. So there were people that might have been neutral or would have been happy to stay um, and, and really intimidated and, and threatened into, into leaving. So I can't help but think about what was going on during that time and how there was all this political division within our nation and how that led to violence. And I'm wondering, even though there were very, very different times, whether there's any sort of cautionary parallel between what was going on then and the political divide we see in our nation now. Yeah, I think that is, it sort of resonates in a frightening way. Um, I think that it, it has become harder and harder for families who disagree politically uh, to tiptoe around the issues. Um, and, uh, and the other thing that I, is a sort of cautionary lesson, I think, is that what happened in the colonies was that control more and more got into the hands of the extremists, the people that were happy to have a revolution or happy to use and did use mob violence. And in Britain, the king became more and more concerned about, you know, clamping down on these Americans and they refused to pay for the tea. But the, the radicals on each side or the people who are entrenched get in control. And so a lot of the people who were moderates um, get, I would almost say outvoted, but they lose power. And it falls into the hands of those who really have a, a more extreme position. It's interesting that after the first battle of the war, Lexington and Concord, Benjamin Franklin toured the country and he said he didn't find anyone who wanted independence. And one of my uh, ad, uh, comments, and I think is the most poignant, is Jefferson in one of the early drafts of the Declaration where he said, we might have been a free and a great people together. And that's so sad because we might have been if there had been more will to have some kind of reconciliation. Joyce, obviously you put a lot of time and effort into researching this book. And I'm wondering if along the way there are things that surprised you, things you didn't expect to uncover in your research. There were. Um, I was very fortunate because there were a series of letters, the Adams letters, the family letters, the Quincy letters. There, um, letters by other people back and forth. Um, I guess what's one of the things that surprised me was how widespread those family divisions were and took on various uh, guises. For instance, there was a, a judge in Salem, Massachusetts, who decided to flee because they, there was a lot of insults. His wife didn't go with him, not that she was a patriot, but she was afraid of crossing the Atlantic. 
which when you think about it was pretty, you know, scary at that time. Um, there was, uh, you know, as I say, um, Hancock's sister-in-law who was in exile. Um, there were, there were many, um, apart from Franklin, who was probably the best known. So I was just surprised at how common that was. James Otis, who was one of the first great patriots, um, had two daughters and one married a British officer and the other married the son of one of Washington's major generals. And you think these, how must that have felt? And then the Quincy case, the older Quincy, who had just the one son left, Samuel, his younger son had died. And within a month of the younger son dying, Samuel decides to go into, for him, exile. But he thought that was going to be a wonderful business opportunity. <laughs> and uh, leaving his wife and children, and he never sees those children again. Um, so I, there were a lot of these personal stories. And I think that it's a way of getting beyond, underneath the, the great events and the usual narrative to get a sense of what that really was what Adams was talking about, about what it cost that generation. And I can't remember whether it's Adams or Quincy, but in one of his uh, letters, he talked about the sacrifice and say, you better make sure you take advantage of the sacrifices I've made and make this a great nation, or he's going to regret all the effort that he put into it. That was Adams. He said that, you know, in heaven, he will be angry that we haven't taken advantage of what it cost those people, you know, uh, their families and going through it, it looked like they were going to lose, you know, and that was really terrifying taking on this great empire. So, um, yeah, it was, it was frightening and they were very bold to do it. Um, this times of try men's souls, that comment, that quote is from Thomas Paine's uh, pamphlet crisis. His first one, Common Sense, at the beginning of uh, 1776, everybody was so enthusiastic, right? By the end of that year, there was a lot of worry about how this was all going to go, and it wasn't so exciting, and maybe they should make some kind of deal. Um, and that's when he talks about people standing firm, the colonists standing firm. So um, they go through a lot of turmoil, and part of it is, well, what I think is very little seen and known, and that is this family uh, and friendship divisions. There's much more in this book that we won't have time to talk about. What would you say are the key insights that you hope readers will take from the book? Well, I think that they need to realize that it might have gone another way, that there was a lot of pushing toward uh, more extreme positions, um, and it was very difficult, as I say, to be a moderate. They didn't want to listen to moderates. Once mob violence was used, that kept going. It was hard to stop it. So I think that's important to take away. Also, the fact that a lot of people who sided with the government, the royal government, or who simply were afraid, um, fled and felt when they went to Britain that they were more Americans than ever. They resented comments about how easy it was going to be to defeat these colonials. Um, and they, they didn't fit in. And you read the stories of uh, Hutchinson, who was the lieutenant governor. It, you know, it's just so sad. He just wanted to go back to his little home in, in Milton, Massachusetts, and lay his bones with those of his ancestors for four generations. So their side of the story is little known and I think very sad. To learn more, the book is The Times That Try Men's Souls, The Adams, The Quincy's, and The Battle for Loyalty in the American Revolution. It's by Joyce Lee Malcolm. Joyce, thank you for talking with me today. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. It was a very educational for me to research all of this, and I hope people will find it interesting. If you'd like to purchase The Times That Try Men's Souls, I've placed a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors on a wide variety of topics, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.